four-part investigation of the orgy of greed and recklessness that drove the world into financial collapse. Only now are the hard questions being asked. Only now are the key players being held to account. In this hour, the story of the men who crashed the world. The billionaire mortgage seller who fooled millions. Everybody wanted to own a piece of real estate to get into the game. The high-rolling banker with a fatal weakness. Jimmy Kane tried to handle what looked like a joint. I'm, I'm not kidding. The ferocious Wall Street predator. I want to reach in, rip out their heart, and eat it before they die. And the power behind the throne. The de facto president of the United States was an unelected gentleman from Wall Street. Meltdown, the secret history of the global financial collapse. The crash of September 2008 brought the largest bankruptcies in world history, pushed over 30 million people into unemployment, and brought many countries to the edge of insolvency. Wall Street turned back the clock to 1929. After the Wall Street crash of 29, which led to the Great Depression, the U.S. Congress launched an official investigation. ...in the senatorial bank investigation as J.P. Morgan arrives to testify. J.P. Morgan was among the business titans to be called to account by the Pecora Commission. Flash photography was introduced to heighten the spectacle. In 2010, the same model is followed for a new investigation of a new financial collapse. Uh, panel, ladies, photographers, move aside. Former California Treasurer Phil Angelitas is chairman of the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission. I'm honored to welcome you as we start this series of public hearings into the causes of the financial and economic crisis. He has taken sworn testimony from a parade of government and bank officials, trying to get to the bottom of what really caused the 2008 meltdown. I, I, I the consequences of this financial crisis have been grim also. Uh, 27 million Americans who are either out of work, um, can't find full-time work or stop looking for work, uh, millions who have lost their homes and millions more who are in the foreclosure process, trillions of dollars of wealth loss. I think one of our jobs is to try to rationally explain to people what the heck happened. People want to know. How did it all go so wrong? The key trigger of the 2008 financial meltdown was easy lending in the U.S. housing market. In an era of very low interest rates and reduced bank regulation, there was an astonishing building boom across the United States. In California, banks decided that virtually anyone could qualify for a home loan. Jim Kling has been a real estate agent in San Diego for over 20 years. Really, in 2004 and 2005, if you could fog a mirror, you could get a loan. That's how bad it was. They didn't really know or care about the qualifications of the buyers. And, a payment on that. and whether those people could make those payments or not apparently wasn't much of a concern. Bills getting to be more than you can manage. Crossroads Mortgage has a whole range of solutions geared to people just like you. So if you're thinking of buying a home or refinancing? Even if your credit is less than perfect, AmeriQuest can help. Call one 866 banks began making what were called subprime loans to people who could ill afford to pay back the money, especially if house prices ever went down. The one man who could have stopped that practice was then U.S. Federal Reserve Chairman Alan Greenspan. For 20 years, the world's most powerful banker. Greenspan was revered in Washington power feared even by presidents. The Federal Reserve was the one agency that had the full authority to regulate subprime lending. 
And despite all the evidence, despite all the yellow and red lights going off, they chose not to. Staff reports. I mean, would you, let me just ask you, would you put this under the category of oops? Should have done it? I mean, my experience has been, uh, in the business I was in, I was right 70% of the time, but I was wrong 30% of the time, and there are an awful lot of mistakes in 21 years. And I would point out that the captain of the Titanic was 99% right and 1% wrong. It's the size of the mistake that matters. We now know that banks and mortgage companies were indulging in all sorts of fraudulent practices to pump up their mortgage business. Many of the loans were extremely complex and the terms hidden from borrowers. There were low teaser rates that would automatically reset to much higher payments after a few months. It was no accident that the most complex mortgages were sold to the least sophisticated buyers, especially in poor and minority neighborhoods like this one in South Central Los Angeles. So as you go about your daily work and your daily business, Congresswoman Maxine Waters has represented the district for 19 years in the U.S. House of Representatives. Information. You know, I've seen mortgages that were given to 70-year-old people who were on a fixed income, whose income was never going to increase, but that market was going to reset within a few years. Where was that money going to come from? I've seen uh, mortgages that I think are criminal. Angela Mozilla was the undisputed king of the U.S. subprime market. He is called the golden boy because of his permanent tan and because at the height of the subprime real estate boom, he was making about $100 million a year. Everybody wanted to own a piece of real estate to get into the game. He became the darling of business magazines with a slew of fawning profiles of his rags to riches story. He always claimed that he was a friend to the poor and that his lending practices were helping scores of Americans attain the dream of home ownership. It's one thing for him to say that he was a friend to the poor, but in the final analysis, when you see that these poor people are now in foreclosure, now cannot get loan modifications, now ending up on the streets, then certainly that defies uh, how he could have been, you know, a friend to poor people. Mozilla's company, Countrywide Financial, grew to become the biggest mortgage lender in the United States. Call Countrywide. We never stop thinking about what you need. And that makes home buying easy. Really. Countrywide was sold to Bank of America and almost immediately plunged in value. Angela Mozilla was placed under investigation by the Securities and Exchange Commission. The SEC uncovered very damaging private emails in which Mozilla expressed his true feelings about the dangerous subprime mortgages he was peddling. He wrote, In all my years in the business, I have never seen a more toxic product. At the same time, Mozilla was publicly reassuring all his investors and clients. Countrywide views the product as a sound investment for our bank and a sound financial management tool for consumers. It does appear that there was a private view of the markets and there was one that was espoused to borrowers, uh, rating agencies, the investing public. The SEC has now charged Mozilla with insider trading and securities fraud. Lenders like Angela Mozilla really didn't care if people ever paid their mortgages because those loans did not stay on the mortgage company's books. Mortgages were bundled together with other loans from across the country and moved to Wall Street. There, they were packaged up into complex new financial products. Bankers went wild for these financial securities that were really just stacks of IOUs. There was almost no government regulation of this market. It became a massive system of buying and selling these IOUs with fees being charged on each transaction. It was just all a way to make fees and to package up these streams of supposed cash flows and sell them off to investors. I mean, for a while there, anybody who touched a mortgage made money. It was like the most perfect product. I once had this view that when people started talking about toxic assets, that somehow they were like a good piece of fruit that had turned bad. Well, it turns out they were a rotten piece of fruit from day one. And all along the way, whether it was the broker, the lender, 
the securitizer, the market maker, everyone seems to have taken the view that they had no responsibility for the product that they were moving along in the system. That became, unfortunately, uh, this cancerous material that was injected into financial institutions all over the world. One of the first places these toxic products landed was the financial district of London, England, nicknamed the city. There was a golden age here in the years before the meltdown. Garrett Anderson arrived in the city as a young trader in 1996. He had been a hippie selling trinkets on the beaches of India until his older brother found him a job in a London brokerage. I literally didn't know what the city was. I mean, I, I kind of was aware that there was a stock market, and I, and I said, well, why? I mean, you have to wear a suit and, and things like that. And he said, I'll tell you why. It's quite simple. You'll have about three, four hundred thousand pounds within about four or five years, and then you can go off and live the life you, wa you want to live. Since the selling of trinkets wasn't going down too well, I thought, why not? <laughs> I had no idea about finance whatsoever. I didn't know what a P-E ratio was. I didn't know what a yield was. When you're in the city, all you have to do continually is present a view and present it strongly and pretend you believe in it. It was all about schmoozing clients, taking them to strip joints, taking them to bars, getting that company uh, credit card out and really giving it a bash. The wild atmosphere in Britain was brought about because Chancellor of the Exchequer Gordon Brown was easing financial regulation there. He called his new approach the light touch. We will advance if there is light touch regulation, a competitive tax environment and flexible. Well, Gordon Brown light touch was an effort really to make the city of London the world's greatest financial centre. Um, and it meant giving the financiers, giving the bankers a very free hand in the marketplace. Paul Martin was Canada's finance minister in those years. He says deregulation came about because of a competition between New York and London to become the financial capital of the world. The race to become number one was very, very important. But how do you attract the financial industry? Well, the most logical way is what they call regulatory arbitrage, which simply says, let's gut the regulatory system, and therefore people will, more people will come. But the prevailing culture was one that um, you know, the markets always go up. It was an easy way to make money, drinking champagne, fat cat analysts. Um, it was a joyous time. Everywhere you looked, there was great big new offices being put up, statues being put in the forecourts, people building great monuments to themselves in, in terms of the buildings they occupied and the way that they behaved. By 2004, Garrett Anderson was making a salary of $300,000 a year, plus an annual bonus of $700,000. He was invited onto business television shows as an analyst. Strong. We had profit before tax growth of 9.5%. The whole game is increasing your bonus. You don't go into the city to do the world some good. You go there to make money as quickly as possible. And if that means lying, cheating and stealing, that's what you do. Regulators and politicians are just deemed to be idiots. It's all about we will thrive with light touch regulation. And that, of course, is exactly what Gordon Brown was encouraging as Chancellor Exchequer. And interestingly, he calls my precise period in the city the age of irresponsibility. But it was partly to do with the fact he just said, anything goes. And, you know, to me, it's just obvious. Th the way people were behaving was a rational way of behaving in the context of the bonus system and the lack of regulation. Before long, the Anglo-American risky financial model was spreading around the world, from Iceland to Dubai. If one country could be the microcosm of everything that went wrong in the years before the meltdown, Iceland is it. It is a place of staggering natural beauty. From its geysers, to its waterfalls, to its famous Blue Lagoon, it is a magnet for tourists. One thing Iceland was never known for was banking and high finance, at least until a few years ago. Iceland was transformed through the ideas of one man, longtime Prime Minister David Odson. 
he decided to shake Iceland out of its social democratic past and remake the country according to his free market principles. He surrounded himself with like-minded admirers. David Oddsson is somebody who fulfills the two criteria that uh, uh, Machiavelli uh, puts uh, up about uh, political leaders. He is cunning as a fox and he is courageous as a lion. David Oxen wanted to privatize almost everything touched by government. Iceland's number one resource industry has always been fishing. Oxen parceled up the country's fishing grounds and passed them off to big ship owners. On Egil Helgeson's popular political TV show, the reaction was disbelief. For many people, this would sound as it's almost surreal. You take the, the fishing grounds, the fish that swims in the sea, and you give it to a bunch of people who own ships for, uh, for good. This is, this is the main resource of our country. This was the beginning of, uh, of, of what came later. In 2003, Odson made his most controversial privatization. Some of the biggest banks in the country were auctioned off in suspicious circumstances. Coincidentally, they ended up in the hands of some of David Odson's closest friends. Mr. Odson's friends were father and son who came from Russia with some money they had made from uh, shady dealings in the brewery business in, in St. Petersburg. And suddenly they were, found themselves to be the owners of the oldest bank in Iceland. These guys didn't know the first thing about banking. Uh, in retrospect, they're either greedy criminals or complete fools. The newly privatized Icelandic banks embarked on an orgy of dangerous financial practices. Bankers sold securities back and forth to each other at vast markups that falsely inflated their value. All Icelanders were encouraged to buy a house, or even two. The central bank lowered interest rates, flooding the country with easy credit. As in the United States, this triggered an unprecedented real estate boom. Icelanders living and working abroad came home to take advantage of the wild market. I lived in the UK till 2003, 2004. Then I came home. I bought a flat for 9 million kroner here downtown, almost close to where we are now. One and a half years later, I sell it for almost 15 million kroner. I'm like, hey, what's, what's going on? I've done nothing to this flat. And here we are, six million kroner in my pocket, just for keeping it for one and a half years. And of course, when you're, when you're benefiting from it, you're sort of, okay, well, this is great. There's a saying now, if something is extravagant, oh, this is so 2007, you can't be serious. 2007 is having Elton John in your 50th birthday party as one of the business tycoons did. People just went too far. People took one loan too many. People bought one car too many. Iceland was not alone in its reckless financial planning during the boom years. The world champion of the global real estate bubble was surely Dubai in the United Arab Emirates. Money was no object, as every local sheikh and every booming company competed to see who could erect the most ostentatious building. No idea was considered too outlandish. When waterfront property rose dramatically in value, Dubai decided to make more. Ships vacuumed sand off the ocean floor to make the famous Palm Islands. On them were built an endless line of luxury condominiums and hotels that were snapped up by wealthy investors from across Europe, Africa, and the Middle East. Canadian Robert Lee went to work for Dubai's leading real estate company 10 years ago. Dubai in its heydays, we used to call the sales center the fish market. Um, it's just, you know, people could come and it would say, give me an apartment, any apartment, I don't care what, two bedrooms, three bedrooms, just give me an apartment. Because in a way, people are buying options because most people were buying things with zero intention of actually living in it. So they were buying coupons to resell it to somebody else. We'd be selling a billion dollars worth of real estate in one day. All of this flowed from the vision of one man, 
Dubai ruler Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum. When he saw the first plans for what would become the world's tallest building, the Burj Khalifa, he had only one comment to the developer, make it bigger. I was silly to uh, suggest a 90-story building, and the meeting was very short. He just left. But, you know, I've been with him a long time, so I've, I went again to the design studios, and then we put something really marvelous, and uh, his question was, how much higher than anybody else? I said, it's about 40% plus. He said, great. He called me the next day, and he said, he said where are the cranes? Was there no limit to how high Dubai could fly before it got too close to the sun? There was always a nagging sensation that is Dubai going to be like the other cities around the world that has seen the fall. But at the same time, you live here for a few years, you basically buy the story. You drink the Kool-Aid. And you saying, hey, we must be different. While Sheikh Mohammed apparently believed that the party could go on forever, some began to wonder when the global real estate bubble would burst and what would set it off. become the central actor in the meltdown took his position on the stage in 2006. Former Goldman Sachs CEO Hank Paulson was one of the toughest of the Wall Street Titans. Then he accepted the invitation of George W. Bush to become the U.S. Treasury Secretary. It was a controversial choice. Paulson was not universally loved on Wall Street. He was probably the nastiest guy of all of them. They used to call him the snake. And this is coming from the Wall Street executives themselves. No, you know, you really can't believe everything he tells you. The reason why they didn't like him is because they couldn't trust him. Hank Paulson's aggressive, combative style came as a bit of a shock in government circles. This is a guy who would go through a brick wall to achieve his objective. Le Leopard doesn't change his spots. I mean, uh, you know, why do scorpions sting? They sting because that's their nature. and. You know, Hank Paulson didn't change his nature when he went to Washington. Shortly after Hank Paulson arrived in Washington, the prices of California houses began to slide. Sales of existing homes are down a full 12% from just a year. As prices dropped, overextended homeowners threw more properties onto the market, triggering a downward spiral. Hank Paulson called me and started talking to me about subprime mortgages um, in the United States. There was a general consensus that there was too much credit and too much money sloshing around globally. We had had discussions about where this excess credit was likely to show itself, and it was uh, showing itself in subprime mortgages in the United States, and that it was a, uh, um, a large problem. Although few seem to realize it, the world was now infected with the toxic financial products that depended on the U.S. real estate market. It was inevitable that someone somewhere was going to blow the whistle and question what these financial products were actually worth. As it happened, the alarm sounded in Paris in August 2007. The giant French bank BNP Paribas discovered that many of its investment funds were filled with toxic U.S. securities. They stopped all withdrawals from those funds. It was a little bit like an old-fashioned movie where the bank president locks the door and tells people they can't get their money. It's kind of, it doesn't exactly make you feel good about the world. At the Ministry of Economic Affairs in Paris, the BNP Paribas decision triggered immediate crisis meetings convened by Finance Minister Christine Lagarde. Ça a commencé de manière très dure, je m'en souviens très bien parce que c'était interruption de vacances immédiate, retour à Paris euh, et, et discussion immédiate avec les banques sur ces conduits qu'elles étaient en train de, de fermer en raison d'un de, de, de début de fissure dans l'édifice financier. If BNP Paribas couldn't value the securities, then 
one started asking how many other companies couldn't value their securities, how did anyone know what the value of asset managers were, or even banks, because of course banks were holding the same securities. And so suddenly faith in some of the foundations of 21st century finance began to crumble. In September 2007, as cracks were appearing in the foundations of the global economy, the titans of the Anglo-American financial system began to tremble. First up was Britain's Adam Applegarth, a true superstar in London's business class. Applegarth had it all. He joined an obscure bank called Northern Rock in 1983 and had a meteoric rise, becoming CEO of the bank in 2001. Oh, he, he was a, a brilliant fellow, full of himself, full of confidence, felt he could do no wrong, loved the idea that he was become a, a transatlantic jet setter. He'd go over to New York to arrange the next tranche of securitized debt and felt he had a model um, which was much better than everybody else. He didn't get it. He didn't, re he didn't get that he developed an unstable model and that the wholesale markets went wrong. Um, his bank would fall off a cliff very, very fast, which is exactly what happened. Good evening. One of Britain's biggest mortgage lenders, Northern Rock, is applying to the Bank of England for emergency financial support. BBC News has learned that the bank... Within hours of the BBC bulletin, worried Northern Rock customers lined up to get their money out. Maybe it's safe, maybe it's not, but I'd rather know that it was safe. I'm just going to go put it in my bank and then... And I've taken all of my money out. Most people in the Western world had never seen a bank run before with their own eyes. And so it was something they found almost impossible to imagine. The British government was very slow to react to the panic. It was egg on our face as the British authorities, no doubt about that. And letting those queues not only form but continue for two days was very damaging to the reputation of British banking. Adam Applegarth was hauled before a British parliamentary investigation of the failure of his bank, but he was characteristically defiant. Mr Applegarth, do you actually accept you've done anything wrong? It was a, a good business model, but clearly couldn't um, deal with the unforeseen global freezing of the liquid market. You keep saying it was unforeseen, yet this committee had been discussing it for six months. The Northern Rock crisis in Britain could have been taken as a serious warning on Wall Street, but it was not. I think people saw this as a, that's happening over there, that's not happening here. I think that the sense of interconnectedness was not realized until the very last moment. Wall Street did not really start paying attention to the growing international crisis until one of its own megastars began wobbling in orbit, the flamboyant head of one of America's oldest and biggest banks. Through the spring of 2008, U.S. Treasury Secretary Hank Paulson was constantly reassuring his international colleagues that everything was fine with the U.S. economy and that only mild tinkering was required with the global financial system. In private, French Finance Minister Christine Lagarde advised her friend that he was being very foolish. I told him, Hank, we see the tsunami that comes on the ground et tu es sur la plage en train d'hésiter sur la couleur du maillot de bain qu'on va porter. The first major US casualty of the financial crisis came with the dramatic fall of one company and one man, the richest CEO on Wall Street. Jimmy Kane was a legend. He had come up through the ranks to become president and chief executive officer of America's fifth largest investment bank, Bear Stearns. He was famous for his back-slapping, hard-drinking, and high-living style. Jimmy is really uh, out of central casting. I mean, I've described him as a, as a, you know, an amiable rogue. I mean, he's uh, definitely can be quite charming. Definitely can be quite ruthless. Uh, has a twinkle in his eye, and I think that combination of ruthlessness and charm that people get to the top with that combination. Jimmy Kane was a flashy risk-taker in business and in his personal life. 
In 2007, he was worth over $1 billion, and he wanted everyone to know it. Every Thursday afternoon after the stock market closed, he would board a private helicopter a few blocks from his Manhattan office and fly off to his country house on the Jersey Shore for weekends of bridge and golf. He did have one troubling habit that would come back to haunt him. He did, used to brag about smoking pot. I'm in the elevator of Bear Stearns, and it was 2004, 2005, and uh, Jimmy Kane tried to hand me what looked like a joint. I'm, I'm not kidding. Kane's pot smoking became public at the worst possible time for his firm. In the fall of 2007, Bear Stearns' risky bets on mortgage-backed securities began to go wrong. The firm started to hemorrhage money. Then in November, the Wall Street Journal carried a front-page story which portrayed Jimmy Kane as an absentee landlord who was always out of touch at either golf games or bridge tournaments while his firm was in crisis. To top it off, the journal publicly revealed his taste for marijuana. Joe Kernan, who's my colleague on CNBC, says, Hey, Charlie, what do you think about that hatchet job that, uh, that the journal just did on, uh, on Jimmy Kane? And I don't know why I did this, but I started imitating smoking a joint. Of course, issue, but also apparently, yeah, that yeah, whole bit. Yeah, a little, uh, little smoke and a little pot say? there. What is it? Two minutes later, my cell phone rings, and it's Jimmy Kane screaming at me. And he's like, what are you doing? You, I, I, I don't smoke pot. I said, stop it. Stop it. I said, I said listen, who cares? I mean, you know, it's, it, you know, you're not breaking the, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of a harmless crime. Why don't you just laugh it off? And I'll never forget what he said to me. He goes, yeah. He goes, laugh it off. You try to laugh it off. You're not running a company. You know, Jimmy had made a lot of enemies on Wall Street. It was a very competitive Darwinian place. Uh, if uh, they smelled, uh, you know, chum in the water, uh, the sharks are going to circle. In January 2008, Jimmy Kane was forced out of the CEO position and became an unpaid chairman of the board at Bear Stearns. But the firm continued a downward slide. It had more exposure to toxic financial products than any other Wall Street firm. Kane had left a ticking time bomb behind him, and it exploded in March 2008. Rumors swept the financial world that Bear Stearns had liquidity problems, trouble raising cash. When Hank Paulson heard the rumors, he told his Washington staff, this will be over within days. He knew that Bear's clients would immediately pull their cash out of the bank, causing it to collapse. We have some breaking business news tonight. The storied investment bank Bear Stearns is reportedly close to selling its... Paulson was right. On Sunday, March 16th, Bear Stearns was taken over by rival J.P. Morgan in a deal bankrolled by the U.S. government. Just one year earlier, Bear's share price had been a lofty $170. Get this, it's valued at about $2 a share in this deal. Two bucks a share just last year. People thought it was a typo. Bear stock had traded, what, in the, in the 30s or 40s? The, the pre closed in the previous Friday, and so, you know, the idea that it would be worth two bucks a share was uh, impossible to fathom. Okay, but can I ask you one question? Do you think that in the... In the, in the, in the, in the in May 2010, when Jimmy Kane was summoned before the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission to account for the collapse of his bank, he seemed to suggest it had nothing to do with him. Kane presented Bear Stearns as a victim of market hysteria. The market's loss of confidence, even though it was unjustified and irrational, became a self-fulfilling prophecy. When I hear a lot of the people come before us, I'm struck by the extent to which all the fingers point away from themselves. And I'm struck by the extent to which so many people on Wall Street somehow do not uh, draw a correlation between the actions and activities and the risks they were undertaking and the crisis that occurred. Most world investors took exactly the wrong message from the bailout of Bear Stearns, that some banks were now considered too big to fail. The key message that emerged after the Bear Stearns bailout was that no matter what happens, the American government, and in fact it was, it was presumed the European government, will not let a big bank go bust. For some on Wall Street, it was obvious that the next domino to fall would be America's fourth largest bank, the venerable Lehman Brothers, run by one of the most feared and ruthless men in the United States.
Perhaps the most reviled figure to appear before the U.S. Congress in the aftermath of the meltdown was former Lehman Brothers CEO Richard Fold. The 2008 collapse of his bank certainly caused the most damage to the world economy, and it financially ruined millions of Americans who had invested with Lehman. I'm very much aware that one day we had a firm, the next day we did not. At the hearings, Fuld became the prime target for a public that was angry at bankers. Dick Fold had spent his entire career at Lehman Brothers, starting at the bottom and clawing his way up the ladder. In later years, he assumed all the trappings of unfettered power. His word was law, his judgment never to be questioned. There was a huge cult of loyalty to Dick Fold as the chief executive of the firm. People on the one hand admired what Dick Fold had achieved, but secondly, this was not an organization where you as a matter of casual incident, decided it was a good idea to disagree with Dick. The way he created Lehman Brothers, it was almost a cult of personality. The, the personality was his personality, which was, we, it's us against them, we're going to fight everybody, and we're going to win. Dick Fold was determined to intimidate anyone who might cross him. In this internal Lehman UK video, he was angry that some traders were driving down his stock price. But what I really want to do is I want to reach in, rip out their heart, and eat it before they die. I think in the tape there's a, there's a sort of nervous laughter in the auditorium. I, I think that sort of reflects quite a lot about how people within Lehman saw Dick. On the one hand, it sounded at one level amusing, and then you sort of thought to yourself, I suspect if you're in that audience, the really scary thing is he sort of could probably do it. Lehman Brothers entered its death spiral on September 11, 2008. The stock was plummeting. Dick Fold was advised that it was time for a fire sale of his corporate assets, but he resisted. Telephone records show that U.S. Treasury Secretary Hank Paulson spoke frequently with Fold, but he felt his message was not getting through. He was definitely exasperated with Dick Fold. I think everybody was. He seemed to be unable to recognize the gravity of the situation his firm was in and unable to do the things that were needed. On Friday, September 12th, Hank Paulson decided that it was time for drastic action to save Lehman Brothers, but he did not want to authorize another government bailout. He flew to New York on his private jet and summoned all the Wall Street CEOs to an emergency meeting at the New York Federal Reserve Building. You know, the fire alarms are going off, the tornado siren is going, and so when the chief of police and the chief of the fire department says we need the, uh, the heads of all the major employers in our town to come together to come up with a plan, you come. At 6 p.m., Hank Paulson started that secret meeting with America's leading bank CEOs. Jamie Dimon of J.P. Morgan, Lloyd Blankfein of Goldman Sachs, John Thane of Merrill Lynch, and John Mack of Morgan Stanley. I began working on a plan. Paulson told them that they all knew why they were there. Without their help, Lehman would not open for business on Monday, and the consequences for everyone sitting around that table would be disastrous. Across town, Dick Fold was astounded that Hank Paulson had not invited him to the crisis meeting. Here his company is basically being carved up, and he's not allowed to be there. He's calling, and they're not returning his calls. Inside Lehman Brothers, there was an air of unreality. The firm had been in existence since 1850. They had survived the Great Depression of the 1930s. They had survived the 9-11 attack that destroyed their offices in the World Trade Center. Surely they could survive this. Tonight, one of the biggest investment firms is in serious trouble. Lehman Brothers with a four... Lehman Brothers stock has been plummeting along with confidence in its ability to survive... These people have been through it before. They were going through it again. Do you know what? The rest of the world hates us, but that's okay because we're going to emerge on top here. And I believe that was what was persisting at Lehman Brothers right until midnight uh, on the famous weekend. I don't think anyone really at the senior management believed it was going to happen. On Sunday, the bankers finally came up with a private sector plan to save Lehman Brothers. The company would be divided in two. 
the solid assets of Lehman would be purchased by Barclays, a British bank. The American bankers agreed to take over the questionable parts of the company. Just as everyone was about to celebrate, word arrived that the British government would not approve the deal. Hank Paulson placed an emergency call to British Chancellor Alistair Darling, but couldn't budge him. I understand Hank Paulson's problem. He had to sort out Lehman's problem. And he was, he, we had, the conversations we had were very amicable, and we understood each other's position. But I was quite clear. Uh, I could not agree to something where the British taxpayer was taking on a liability uh, that people didn't fully understand. Paulson hung up feeling deflated and frustrated. He announced to everyone in the room, the British screwed us. Objectively, this deal was never going to happen. And the most striking thing about this whole story is how little effort the Americans gave to talking to the British authorities until literally the last minute. Paulson knew Lehman's failure would bring financial catastrophe. Millions of people around the world would lose their savings and pensions. At this moment of maximum tension, Hank Paulson had a panic attack. He slipped out of the room and called his wife. I just said, Wendy, Lehman Brothers is going to fail, and it's going to be very bad, and a lot of people are looking to me, and I don't have all the answers, and I'm afraid, would you, would you pray for me? This has been an historic Sunday on Wall Street, Dan, and it's not over yet. At this hour, the Lehman Brothers Investment Bank appears headed toward bankruptcy. With $613 billion in debt, Lehman is by far the largest bankruptcy ever in this country, dwarfing... On the sidewalks of New York and in investment houses around the world, there was a rising sense of panic. One who felt it was Mohammed El Arian of PIMCO in California, among the world's largest institutional investors, with one trillion dollars under management. I remember calling my wife and telling her, go to the cash machine, take cash out, because I'm not sure whether the banks are going to open tomorrow. There was a feeling that the system was incredibly fragile, that the unthinkable was clearly thinkable. Lehman Brothers officially declared bankruptcy at 2 a.m. There was widespread fear that could trigger a chain reaction that would take down the world banking system. At the New York Federal Reserve, then President Tim Geithner told his staff to prepare for the crash landing of Lehman. He told them to put foam on the runway. The problem is they didn't put nearly enough foam on the runway and there were all sorts of unintended consequences. The ripples that they anticipated turned out to be a tsunami. The tsunami unleashed by the crash of Lehman Brothers would sweep around the globe, destroying millions of jobs and wiping out the economic future of entire countries. Protests rocked world capitals. From Reykjavik to Beijing to London. Next time on Meltdown, the Wall Street washout spreads havoc worldwide. While CEOs and senators point fingers in Washington, unemployment and homelessness spread like wildfire. Don't move to California, that's all I gotta say. The entire Western financial system hits bottom. It is just, it's a tragedy. A global tsunami. Dock Zone, next time.